When starting my combat robotics tenure in 2020, I would occasionally hear what can be best described as legends of a powerful horizontal spinner that used to compete in the 30 pound weight category. With a gear driven weapon, it was louder than most and impressively destructive. The robot was built by Glenn and called Obliterator. It recently passed on to another builder some may know, Angus, who worked on bringing it under the new Australian tip speed limits, which is half of the original speed. Now it's been handed down to me, and I endeavour to rebuild it to modern specifications and hear that gearbox scream at full power for myself. In mid-August, I'll be bringing two new featherweights to the Robot Rampage tournament in New Zealand, with this being the main entrant. Having fought through multiple events, this fifth version of Obliterator is in pretty rough shape. I was actually its last opponent when competing with Derive. Our fight ended after Obliterator's drive controller caught fire, this resulted in a deep sanding that pervades the robot to this day. Some parts will not be reused, such as the drivetrain, due to unavailability of spares, as well as the entire frame. It's heavily warped, with various failed welds that are risky to repair, as the heat can damage the treatment of the hardened steel. There are three swappable weapon bars in various stages of wear. One of the lighter bars is completely rounded over, but this can be dealt with by regrinding the tooth and rebalancing based on the lost material. The heavier, aggressive bar is mint and will definitely be integrated into the new design. I believe everything is 16mm thick, Ardox 450. Finally is the main object of desire, the weapon gear motor. Central is a TP Power 4060 inrunner that was customised with a keyed 8mm shaft to fit a set of Azito angle grinder gears. Said motor is rated for a peak power of 6.2kW, though this comes at quite a high rotation speed compared to the usual outrunners. As such, the two-stage reduction is necessary to bring it down to a usable rate, and seeing unsealed angle grinder gears explains the noise I've been told about. With an inventory of the old machine, we need to set goals for a redesign. Primarily, the objective is to hear the weapon gear motor run at full power in combat. Australia has a rather low tip speed of 60 meters per second since I started the hobby, which is half of the original design speed leading to Angus running an outrunner system instead. With the New Zealand limit of 90 meters per second, I'm confident one can use the original system with a few modifications. My other featherweights have been typically made with a large number of simple parts, whereas here I want to try for a small quantity of complex parts, which as much recycling as possible. Finally, my robots have historically been unpainted to expose the machining marks, cluing into how they were manufactured. Additionally, paint is weight that does not go to improving the robot performance. This time I want to try a colour scheme and lean into an aesthetic of some sort, as the machine itself doesn't have that much going on. To inform the final CAD model, I usually flesh out a simplified block CAD to identify each page apart and plan for the later assembly. This is the result of those efforts next to the previous version. The frame went through several iterations to arrive at perhaps a fairly obvious conclusion of an all aluminium construction. I really wanted titanium place to support the weapon, perhaps only the front half even, but could not find sheets large enough nor cheap enough, let alone figure out how to machine them as they're too large for my milling machine. The drivetrain features a motor driving a simple set of spur gears to the wheel instead of the expensive planetary gearboxes. This fits conveniently into a large billet lump of aluminium that mounts the frame plates and side armour. Wheels are set further forward to gain adhesion as the centre of mass is forward towards the weapon. Side armour is a borrowed concept from Derive with two bent pieces of HDPE plastic mounted on rubber shocks. 
Rearward, the fork mounting locations were widened to try and defeat the split wedgelets seen today, where narrow forks would get eaten by a vertical spinner. As usual, the parts for Obliterator have been provided to me by PCBWay. Each piece here, shown, was made of anodized 6061 aluminium without bead blasting to allow the machined finish to show through. Bearing fits were within the specification and all parts fit together nicely. I requested the broken link logo be post machined after anodizing to show a shiny finish, which turned out very well. Similarly, the J profile pulley grooves grip the belt and should transfer plenty of torque to the weapon. All parts are fit for purpose and should be working in the robot before long. This is the production model for Obliterator 6 as I intend to build it. There are three configurations. First uses the lightest weapon bar and a set of forks bolted to the rear. Second features the yet unused aggressive bar with no forks. And finally the same idea using an inertia maximized weapon disc to get the most punishment out of the reduced tip speed limits. It should be apparent that this robot is colored instead of the raw aluminium look I usually go for. While in the transition from BlockCAD to final product, I had spent some time playing the multiverse mod for a game called FTL, which I can highly recommend, and had come across one of the alien races called Augmented Lanius. Their spacecraft feature a shiny black finish, accented by a vibrant energized green and the occasional grey mechanics underneath. I thought this looked amazing, and quickly implemented it on Obliterator. The plan for a red, black and silver scheme was replaced with the aforementioned. Large aluminium frame parts are anodized black on a mill finish to add a little sheen that bead blasting would dull. Turns out green carbon fiber exists and is now inset into the top of the robot. Bright green anodizing adorns the weapon hub and pulley to be complemented by a similar paint on the weapon blades that should form rings when they're spun around up to speed. Drive blocks and weapon nuts will remain a shiny uncoated mill finish to accent the surrounding blacks. Finally, the new steel weapon support plate will be painted white, deviating from the augmented look, but I think it's the right move to keep things visible. As mentioned, this variant moved away from the dual aluminium weapon support for a composite of both aluminium and hardox. The latter should be able to handle the out of plane forces such as a vertical spinner hit, while the aluminium is a lightweight solution to the usual impacts from its own weapon. This hardox plate has rather complex pocketing, which looks cool, but is definitely not structurally optimal, though I decided it was worth the trade-off. Lightweight carbon fiber plates add stiffness to the heavily pocketed frame, but need to be kept out of the line of fire. Each side of the robot features a drive pod that is completely interchangeable on each side, meaning one spare unit will fit either if something fails. The wheels have bushings that ride on a smooth shoulder bolt axle, off-the-shelf parts that are easy to stock up on. All of this, including the shock-mounted armor, affixes to the most complex part in the design. A large block of aluminium with mounting features all over, for the frame, wheel, motor and armour. The angled features will be quite a challenge for me to manufacture on a 3-axis mill. I'm yet to come up with a plan on how to drill those armour mounting holes accurately. Compared to Obliterator 5, the wheels are shifted further forward to approach the centre of mass. It's debatable whether this is actually a good idea, as it's trading stability for adhesion, but I'm keen to give it a go. Electronically, the robot is rather basic. Rhino 80 AM32 ESCs will control the drive motors, with a large 6S battery supplying everything at just over 25 volts. Powering the weapon motor is either an old school 200 amp red brick, or a more modern VESC 6.7. The former is what the machine has run historically and has plenty of burst power, but terrible thermals due to the stacked construction. A VESC is smart capable of limiting self appropriately to run a whole match without trouble, but incapable of handling the massive startup currents that a red brick can. It simply limits these to protect itself at the cost of a slightly increased spin-up time. Some more specialized ESCs were recommended to me, such as the Castle Mamba line, but at 350 Australian dollars shipped a piece, they were absurdly expensive compared to the Vesk or red brick, triple the price or more. While I do believe they're a good choice, I want to try and get by with less. As for the weapon system itself, it's quite similar to the original stack up. Two tapered roller bearings support the hub with a pulley on one side and a bar on the other. These bearings need to be properly preloaded with set, spaces, top and bottom. 
Screws on either end of the Schweppen shaft will clamp the plates, shims, inner bearing races and middle spacer together into one rigid stack. Assuming the heights are set correctly, the bearings can operate at their rated load capacity and make for an extremely durable weapon hub. Overall the reduction from motor to weapon is 8.5 to 1, or 5200 RPM at the blade. With the model complete, the next step is to simply crank out parts in the workshop to get the robot finished. Alongside Obliterator is a new featherweight melty brain called Tessellate, which has been constructed at the same time and will be covered after the next Obliterator video. Until next time.